Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Where is it? Oh, I hate giving bad reviews. I hope it doesn't turn into a rant. I am full on Canadian tuxedo today. I am denim on denim and I don't care. Hey everybody, welcome back to Books Yada Yada. I'm Dina and thank you for watching my channel. So today what we have are two quick, hopefully, reviews and a the grocery store tag, shopping tag, something like that. Anyhow, so first book, Confessions on the 745 by Lisa Unger. So in this book, talked about it in my October TBR, we have a woman named Selena who is traveling on the train, the 745, and the train gets stalled. She sits down next to another woman named Martha, and they start striking up a conversation. They're having a couple of cocktails while they're, you know, um, stuck on the train. All of a sudden, that light banter turns a little heavy because Martha reveals to Selena that she is having an affair with her boss. And then in turn, Selena reveals to Martha that she suspects her husband, Graham, is having an affair with the nanny, Geneva. Yeah, that's the nanny's name, Geneva. So the train starts moving, they part ways, and Selena just thinks she'll never hear from Martha again. Well, that is not what happens. Um, this is the kind of book that is told in multiple points of view. You have a lot of different characters going on, and I love that. Interesting, it made it very um, gripping right off the bat. It hit the ground running, and I love that. Until I got to probably around page 200, where everything fell apart. Try to sum it up in a nutshell, where if you enjoy books about grifters, abusive husbands, about women who are weak, manipulative people, and situations that are just completely improbable, then this is the book for you. Again, it's fiction. That's why we read fiction, right? Because these things don't happen in real life for the most part. I was so disappointed because I really, you know, as I said before, love Lisa Unger and she wrote a book a long time ago called In the Blood and I loved that book. It, for me, was just a couple rungs below Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. It was a, one of her shorter novels and I think she does much better at writing shorter books, novellas, and short stories than she does with um, heavier books. This one's not too bad. It's only like 360 pages long. And I'm, I'm afraid this is going to turn into a little bit of a rant. I'm not spoiling anything. I'm just telling you my honest opinion of the book. Because of these multiple point of views, that was really engaging at first. But then she abused that by, by misdirecting us, the reader, by continuing to use these point of views over and over again and using these misdirections and um, derailing, so to speak, pardon the pun, um, you, but then not really. And I figured this book out, like I said, right about it at 200 pages. I'm like, oh my God, I just know where this is. I know where this train is going. And you know what? There was no train in this. The train was at the very beginning and that's it. Like nothing else happens on a train, I was expecting, like, you know, with a cover like this, right, and a title like this, that it was going to be some kind of cool train mystery, you know what I mean? Maybe not completely, but parts of it, no, that's not the case. Um, so in those misdirections, you know, you really get annoyed. And I found myself getting extremely annoyed. Um, it was, again, very predictable, very um, over and over, a lot of the phrasing. You, you wonder, you're like, didn't I just read that in the last chapter about how cer cerulean blue the sky was? Like that word gets used so much. And then um, other phrasing as well. So I almost felt like there was a problem with the editing. Like it could have been edited a little bit better and maybe it wasn't Lisa Unger's fault. <laughs> it just did not do it for me. All of my conclusions were correct and it was no surprise at all. There wasn't any big twist for me. I mean, you might like this book. I don't know. I, I just felt like it had absolutely no atmosphere whatsoever. I like books that really slather on the atmosphere and not for like chapters, 
but just, you know, a few paragraphs to kind of, you know, invite you into the story and make you feel like you're part of it, right? This ha did not have that at all. I almost felt like there was no setting in this book. And it takes place in Manhattan. It takes place in the city. And in, I believe, the outskirts, but we really don't know because she doesn't talk about it at all. A lot of you know when you read books about New York, New York, New York City or Manhattan becomes a huge, a huge character in the book because there's so much about it that you can use to add to the story, right? So that just didn't happen. That was a big bummer. So anyway, moving on to the next book. So the next book was The House Guest by Mark Edwards. And I talked about again in my October TBR. Um, this book was great, okay? So you have a British couple named Ruth and Adam who meet a American couple named Jack and Mona on a cruise. They strike up a great friendship with Jack and Mona on this cruise. And Jack and Mona are like, hey, anytime you're in New York, you know, you, you, can, you are more than welcome to stay with us. And as the opportunity would strike, Jack and Mona happen to go on a retreat to New Mexico. And Ruth and Adam end up staying, house-sitting house basically, for Jack and Mona at their um, Williamsburg uh, residence, in, which is a part of Brooklyn. And so um, Ruth and Adam are settling into New York life. They're really enjoying it. They're a young couple. Um, Ruth is an aspiring actress. Adam is a um, aspiring writer. So one rainy night in Brooklyn, this stranger appears at their doorstep, right? And her name is Eden. And Eden um, is a mess. She's uh, a drowned rat, basically. She's, she's down on her luck, and she's, she's asking them if she can stay with them because she knows Jack and Mona. And she's like, call Jack and Mona. They will tell you we're good friends, that it's fine if I stay here for a couple of nights. And so Ruth and Adam end up, you know, trying to contact Jack and Mona. They don't hear back because they're in this retreat in New Mexico, right? So they leave it up to their intuition, and they're like, yeah, Eden, you can stay. No problem, right? Eden and Ruth and Adam end up having um, a nice time together. Everything seems to be going well. Until one night when someone's like, you know, let's bring out the booze, right? And they start doing shots of tequila and doing whiskey and they're drinking champagne and they're just like going crazy partying. And the next morning, Adam wakes up and Ruth and Eden are missing. They're gone. That's where the story starts. So Adam is on this frantic journey to try to find Ruth. He has no idea what happens. Along the way, he meets these very interesting people, are connected to Eden, try to help Adam, or so he thinks, because this is the kind of book where you can't really trust anybody. What ends up happening is you have, again, as I said before, this cult. I'm not going to spoil it, but there is a cult involved in this whole situation. It was a gripping read for me. And what I love about Mark Edwards as a writer is that he is the kind of writer that grabs you by the seat of your pants, you know, and takes you on this wild ride. Very fast paced read, very exciting, lots of twists and turns. Again, you don't know who to trust. He is great at writing male dingalings. So Adam is kind of a dingaling where the women in the books in a lot of Mark Edwards books are not. And I appreciate that a great deal. So it's sort of like the coin getting flipped because he does that a lot. And um, in a lot of the other books I read by him, he uses these male characters and you're just like, oh my God, this guy is such a ditz, right? <laughs> Another thing I appreciated about this book was that it had atmosphere. Thank you, Mark Edwards. Mark Edwards is a British writer. And so apparently he had spent some time in New York and in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And so he was able to get a really good feel for the area. And what I loved about it was that he wrote about almost all the five boroughs, including Staten Island, which is so weird because nothing ever happens in Staten Island. <laughs> <laughs> like you never hear about Staten Island, <laughs> except for what we do in the shadows. That is a great show. You guys love that show? Comment down below. Let me know, right? Who's your favorite character and what we do in the shadows? <laughs> but yeah, so he did, Mark Edwards was a great job of like using New York. It was, again, it was a great read. Um, really, really, um, really fun. And um, Mark Edwards has this way of leaving his books open-ended. So you kind of can guess for yourself what 
might or might not have happened. And I enjoy that because it's very gratifying. The house guests recommend it for sure. Okay, grocery shopping book tag. I think it was created by Jason at Byways in Bookland. So I will link his channel down below. Um, I, was, I was tagged in this, sort of. I was on BookTube this morning watching um, Summer from Cozy Reading with Quaker Cats. Oh, I botched that. But so Summer, Summer, thank you for doing this tag because it really was a fun one. And I, I so enjoyed watching her do this that I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this tag. It sounds like a lot of fun, right? So um, she basically tagged anybody who was watching it. And um, so I tagged myself. Um, so let's get started with it. Number one, list. Before going book shopping, including virtually, do you have a list? Yes, I get easily distracted, as you all know. Number two, fruit and veg. Good for the body and mind. Recommend a book you felt improved your physical and mental health. Well, let's see here. I have a couple of different authors here. So the first one is um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks. Now, if you don't know who Oliver Sacks is, he um, was a very prominent neurologist and worked at um, Bellevue, uh, which is a um, psychiatric facility in New York for years. And he wrote a book called Awakenings, which was adapted later on into a movie starring Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. And Robin Williams actually played um, Oliver Sacks in the film. He was such a great author because he wrote a lot of clinical type books, but they didn't feel clinical. And I read a lot of his books while I was in um, Scott College pursuing my um, various degrees and certifications and specializations. Um, and so these were amazing to me because they're all about people who have had some kind of traumatic brain injury that triggered something else. He writes about people who um, have gained sort of almost like a, a superhuman type of quality after they've had, again, some kind of traumatic brain injury happen to them. And it's fascinating. So if you ever saw the movie Awakenings, you know what I mean. Um, he was, Oliver Sacks was just an amazing, amazing person, an amazing scientist. And um, he wrote another book, which I loved, called Musicophilia, is a, which is a collection of different clinical cases and studies about people who, again, have had something traumatic happen to them. A case where a man got struck by lightning and then all of a sudden wakes up one morning, basically, and can start playing the piano. After this whole thing happened, he learned piano like that. And performs and is making a living doing that. So there's various cases where music became a part of their life where it really wasn't before. My point is by reading his books, it made me feel like way less weird. I don't know why, but they definitely are awesome to pick up anything by him. Another one is Full Catastrophe Living. This is another one that I had to read for um, my, my license um, as a holistic health counselor. Um, and this one is chalk filled with and what's called MBSR, which is mindfulness-based stress reduction. And so it goes into using um, the wisdom of your body, your mind, and your, and your spirit basically to face stress, pain, and illness. Um, so in the holistic counseling world, this is a pretty um, famous book, but it is a wonderful book for anybody to read who just needs to balance out their whole state of being. Um, extremely important to be able to balance your mind, body, and soul, because if one of those things is out of balance, the others will be out of balance as well. So it's a way to homeostasis. And I loved this book, and I really um, valued this book a great deal for um, my own physical and mental health. Full Catastrophe Living um, by John Cabot Zinn or John Cabot Zinn. Next question. Tinned goods, regardless of the label on the can, the contents are all too often bland. 
What's your tin can genre? Romance. Can't do it. Number four, meat slash fish counter prepared by a skilled butcher slash fishmonger, just how you want it. Tell us a book you felt was written just for you. All right, I have a few. I have a couple different authors here. First one is Shit My Dad Says by Justin Halpern. I read this a long time ago. Um, it is just a great book because I lost my dad uh, going on, oh my God, going on 14 years ago, actually this month, October uh, 24th. And my father and I were extremely close. And so this book was, um, I read after my father had passed away, but it's so funny because basically it's just a lot of um, little like journal entries and stories about his father. Um, but then like these topics that, you know, his father had great quotes for and like on dealing with bullies, you're going to run into jerk offs, but remember it's not the size of the asshole you worry about. It's how much shit comes out of it. I'm going camping with the family. No, I'm going to stay home. You can take a family vacation and I'll take a vacation from the family. Trust me, it'll make both of our time much more enjoyable. <laughs> this book just, I read it. It was probably sh maybe shortly after my father passed away, but this actually helped me in the healing process because I laughed out loud so hard and I do felt, feel like it was written for me. So um, thank you, Justin Halpern, for writing this book. It was phenomenal. Writer is Augustine Burroughs. Every Augustine Burroughs book I have ever read, right? And I've got like just two that I could find. I have the rest of the physical book somewhere. Um, I've ever read, I felt like it was written for me. I swear, I feel like he's my soul brother. Um, everything that he writes, I go, yes, yes, yes. You know, he wrote Running With Scissors. Um, most of his books are memoirs um, dealing with his life uh, raised in a very bizarre way. And he's extremely relatable um, and so, so funny. And I would definitely check him out. Um, because he's just a fantastic writer. Sometimes you go, wow, my life wasn't that bad. Like he makes you feel much better about your life. He does. Uh, number five, baked goods. Bread is a staple for many around the world. Who is an author you can easily digest at any time of the day? Alice Hoffman. I just love Alice Hoffman. I love anything she writes. She wrote Practical Magic. That's probably the book that she's most famous for. She is just a wonderful, wonderful writer. She's one of those writers that um, blends magical realism in her book. So she's very diverse in her writing. And, and again, I appreciate that. I appreciate diverse writers. Um, but she's definitely uh, my baked goods writer because I know that I can pick up an Alice Hoffman book, easily digest it, and easily relate to it and, um, and, and just eat it up. Okay. Like bread. Another one is, um, Neil Gaiman. Of course, this is the graveyard book. Um, I just happened to pull this one up. So I was not going to grab the Sandman because that's huge and it weighs like 20 pounds. And I already did that in one of my other videos and I almost like dropped it on my foot, but he's another one that I can just live in his world. And um, his books are just so creative and beautifully written. And so he's another one that is a complete staple. I have all of his books on my shelves. Another one is Henning Mankel. Um, he wrote the Kurt Wallander series. It's a Swedish detective series. Um, it's sort of considered Nordic, Nordic noir books. These are the kind of books I love to read in the, the wintertime um, because there are just something about them. I don't know. It's like cold usually in these books, but something about them just makes me feel warm. I love Kurt, the character of Kurt Wallander. Um, he is a very plagued individual, very relatable. I just love the way Henning Mankel uh, writes these books. There's quite a few in the series. This is number one. This is Faceless Killers. Again, staple. Okay, question number six. Chilled section. Recommend a cool new author or book you recently discovered. Oh, Peter Swanson has become one of my favorite new authors, and I just started reading him this year. He writes in this incredibly noir, 
style. He's kind of like a throwback to Ira Levin, like early Ira Levin works and Patricia Highsmith, but in a very modern feel. Um, so I love his books. I gobbled them up once quarantine started. So March and April and part of May were completely Peter Swanson uh, filled. So Peter Swanson for sure. Number seven, Frozen sh Section. Tell us about a book that gave you the shivers. Ooh, um, there was a book I read about 20 years ago called Under the Skin by Michael Faber. That book freaked me out, like the way Silence of the Lambs freaked me out. This book just was so, so creepy. It um, is about a, a alien, basically, who comes to Earth. She goes through um, all these different procedures to make herself look as human as possible to be able to fit into society in order to pick up hitchhikers. And what they're doing with these hitchhikers are turning, in the, turning them into meals for other aliens. It takes place in Scotland and in, the, in I believe the Highlands. And so the atmosphere in that book was very dark and very, um, very creepy. Um, but I, again, I haven't reread that book, read it 20 years ago, and it stuck with me and it spooked me out. It was so freaky, but it was excellent. Uh, there was a film adaptation with Scarlett Johansson that came out maybe, I don't know, eight years ago or something like that, which it wasn't that great. It wasn't faithful to the books. Number eight, Beer, Wine, Spirits. Name one of the first books that made you feel like an adult. Oh, the whole Earth's Children series by Jane, by Jean Owl. Um, it's missing the first one, which should be right here, which is Clan of the Cave Bear, because I let my daughter borrow it. But yes, I did read this whole series. I gotta put this down. <laughs> um, I read Clan of the Cave Bear when I was 13 or 14, that book just was amazing. That it made me feel like an adult because it, it was a chunky book. It was the chunkiest book I ever read, I think, at that age. And then the other books in the series are get larger and larger and larger. But it tells a story of um, a Cro-Magnon woman named Ayla. So during the Earth's transformation and the tectonic plates being separated, um, her parents are killed in a earthquake and she is left alone and then ends up being adopted reluctantly by a Neanderthal clan and they raise her. The, the writing is beautiful. The stories are beautiful. Um, Ayla goes through so much just to become part of the clan and they don't make it easy for her. And I don't know why, but I identified with Ayla's character, um, especially at that age, because I, was, I had no friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt the same way trying to be accepted and, uh, you know, and being bullied and, and whatnot. And so um, that book stuck with me. Another one is To Kill a Mockingbird, which I have somewhere, but this is taking a long time, so I don't want to um, pull it out. But To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee um, was definitely another book that I read in my youth that um, made me feel like an adult because it made me question a lot. Um, number nine, sweets and candy. What genre author is your indulgence when you need a little treat read? Um, well, I'm going to have to go with my cozies, you guys, because I do read cozy mysteries when I need a palate cleanser, right? And I kind of think that I need a palate cleanser right now. The one is Coffee House Mysteries by Cleo Coyle. It's about a coffee house in New York City. The female protagonist of the book series is a very strong woman. She's very um, smart. She um, solves mysteries, of course, and they talk about coffee. Those are fun. Uh, number 10, magazine stand. If you read magazines slash journals, regularly share some titles with us. No, I don't at all. I listen to podcasts. So those would be my, my magazines. Um, number 11, check out. Time to go home and unpack. Tag some shoppers on their way in. Consider yourself all tagged if you want to do this. It was fun. <laughs> um, so that is it for today, you guys. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you the next time.